Hello, my name is Lavina Ray, Chair of NSH's Awards Committee. In this series, Awards Cast, recipients of various NSH awards and scholarships will discuss the projects these scholarships have funded and share some of the life-changing opportunities they have encountered as a result of their involvement in the scholarship program. My name is Emily Foster. I'm the recipient from NSH's Symposium Convention Student Leadership Scholarship in 2019. I'm a recent graduate from Cobleskill University's Assistant Technician Program. I'm here today with Dr. Guy Orchard, who is the recipient of NSH's 2019 Like a Leadership in Management Scholarship. Would you like to tell us more about yourself and, and where you work? Uh, uh, yes, I'll try not to bore you. My name is Dr. Guy Orchard, as Emily has pointed out. I work at St. John's Histopathology Department, which is in St. Thomas's hospital, which is the hospital opposite the Houses of Parliament in, in London. I've been there a long time. I'm the lab lead and I've been in charge for 20 years in that position here, although I've been in this same department, man and boy, almost my entire working career, which now spans about 30 years. My official title is consultant grade biomedical scientist and I oversee all the derm path laboratories, which includes an immunocytochemistry service, a routine histology service and a Mohs micrographic surgery service, which is actually located at the other hospital because we're two hospitals that are united and the other hospital is called Guy's Hospital, which is ironic because that's where I was born. Uh, that's another story. Anyway, yes, yeah, so my Mohs service is over at Guy's. So I flip between the two hospital sites, which are very closely located. Right. How did you yes. find out about histology? Yes, well, I, I came in as a fresh-faced 19-year-old, and I did all my qualifications, professional qualifications, so I actually hold three higher degrees, and we had to do a fellowship examination to become an, um, a fellow of the Institute of Biomedical Sciences, which I did first. I then did a Master of Science in Immunology, and then after that, I went on to do a PhD, which was in about 2010. So that's, that's the path. It's not a, a requirement for us all to do PhDs these days, but it, it was an opportunity that came to me because I was teaching and lecturing a lot. So at the universities around, been in and around London, and so they asked me uh, if I wanted to do a PhD, and so of course I said yes. With regard to management, I found myself progressively moving away from the day-to-day -day bench work because I was responsible for developing techniques and then after developing techniques I was responsible for managing the techniques mm. and then managing services so it's a natural gravitation towards more and more management uh, as you have more and more experience I guess. You were spending your award money I believe on education for for your staff mm. and you want to tell us more about that and, and why you're so passionate yes. about education? Yes we have quite a, a good reputation here for teaching and training generally, because I work in a very specialist unit anyway, it is a national center for skin disease where I work. And so we have to train our staff to quite a high level so they understand and comprehend all the diagnostic work they do, but also the research and development that we also do a lot of. So my staff need to be quite well trained and they also need to be academically quite gifted. Uh, generally. Uh, that's just the nature of what we do. And in order to supplement and support those activities, we have a, a quite well-developed CPD program, which is continuing professional development. I'm quite sure you have something similar in the US. Um, this is a meeting point. Every month we have meetings for the department and associated departments that are not necessarily under my control, but are similar to us and they're invited to come along and listen to a speaker. And we arrange various lunchtime sessions for this. So that's an area that I'm quite keen to continue supporting. And because it's lunchtime, they will have to have a lunch provided and things like that. So that's something that I'm looking at. We also have within our organization, this is Viapath, we also have an organization there called the Future Leaders. These are very enthusiastic young young individuals who are coming into our workplace and who are keen to 
develop their skills and assist others to do the same. And we call those individuals who are selected and put into that scheme the future leaders. Uh, I've got a couple of my staff who've been on that scheme and I've got more that want to go on the scheme. And they do lots of good work, which includes organizing events which is shared amongst the entirety of the workforce, not just within my department, but across the two hospital sites. We have competitions between departments. Uh, these could be academic, these could be social. Um, we had 10 pin bowling one occasion, I remember. We've done all kinds of activities, but it's also integrated to the management and how they develop as individuals. One of the better things they do is do videos. And I was asked to give a video for them, the title of which was called Dying for a Tan. And they video record me uh, giving a lecture, uh, which is then seen and shared with all those that are on the Viapath Facebook. And so that was quite popular. And they've only just started doing that, but they, they don't always have all the right equipment to be able to facilitate things like that. So again, I'm quite keen to look at that and see if I can help them with this, this money to see if they can get them a decent a camera to record things. Also, we are quite active sending staff to congresses and conferences, much like the NSH and national equivalent ones over here. So some money could be used to help support those staff that I'd like to send, but there wasn't enough money in the, in the coppers to be able to send them along. It's nice to have a bit of spare cash to, to consider that option. So that's another area. And most importantly, and I think for me, having gone through quite a long educational pathway, is that it's all about resources, really, and encouraging staff to reach their full potential or true potential. And quite often, this doesn't always happen because they're just not in the right environment for that to, to grow. So I'm always very keen on involving all my staff in, in all the research papers and publications that I myself might write so that they get recognized for what they do. I think that's important because it actually helps them encourage to, do, to develop their skills. So again, in those areas where I can help them and get them to get involved in research and development and get their names on scientific publications that contribute to advancement of their discipline, I think is also important. So those are the areas, really. Has your own educational path, I know we were working while gaining your various degrees, has that influenced your opinion and, and your passion for education and, and helping your staff increase their, their careers? Yes, it's a very good question, and the answer is yes. If you'd have told me when I started that I'd wind up becoming the chief examiner nationally for histopathology, that I'd be organizing the exam frameworks for all the diplomas that the professional body over here, your equivalent of the NSH is the Institute of Biomedical Sciences over here. For them, I am the chief examiner for histopath, so I'm responsible for writing the annual exams for the students that go for the fellowships. Uh, but as I said at the beginning, if I was told, if you said to me, oh, guys, this is what's going to happen to you, you're going to wind up doing this, I'd have laughed at you, let alone believed I could do a PhD because I didn't have an awful lot of confidence when I was a, a young man. Now people tell me I've got bags of it. <laughs> I guess that's, uh, that's, it, that's having the experience uh, and the confidence comes through having the experience. Do you have a, a favorite part of, of the routine stuff and from, from when you did bench work? You know, did you have a favorite piece of it? Hmm. Well, I spent many years doing immunocytochemistry before it was automated. In fact, I, I was doing it. And then when it, I saw the automated platforms come in and I, I adapted and developed our, our automated platforms here, I was then also in charge still when we moved into the more advanced automated platforms that enable you to do in situ hybridization now. Uh, I, I, I was around when we installed all those machines. Uh, I saw my workload go from you know, one machine to two machines to three machines, which is currently what we've got and we could do with a four, to be honest. So it's all about volumes now, isn't it? Because what's happened is the new technologies, you may think, oh, we'll just do the same small amount of work on the, but we'll be able to do it quicker because we're automated. Well, what happens in reality is that more tests come along and you simply have, you just simply do more tests. You have a bigger platform, you can do more size, you do more tests. So it naturally progresses and that's, what I've seen happen in, in every sphere of, of my work here. Because uh, I, I, when I started Mose, for instance, we only did it one day a week. Well, now, 15 years on, we do it five days a week. Mm -hmm. So, and we do 
we used to do seven or eight cases a week. Well, we do 50 now. So the reality of it is there's no problem with the patients. We've got loads of those queuing up at the doors. So you're still going to need the techniques and the, and the abilities of the staff to deliver all of that. So as I see it, it's a continual development. Well, you're managing so many different aspects, right? The Mohs side and the dermatopathology lab. Um, are there any major difficulties in managing so many broad, varied things? Do you have any keys and tricks for, well, for keeping that? Well, okay. So I think the answer to that uh, is just be yourself in the way you manage yourself. It's, it's very key that your personality type fits the environment that, that you're working in. I always listen a lot. So I'll listen to what the issues or things and problems may be, and then I'll make a strategy of how I would tackle it. I'll then discuss it with the staff and be very open and frank about what we want to achieve and, and how we're going to do it. And then I'll listen again to see what the feedback is, and then I'll readjust, and then I'll decide this is a course of action. Because you've had an open debate, you, you brought all your staff in, they know you've listened, you made a decision, you explain your decision, and you implement. That generally works, in my opinion. In regard to diversity of things that I've managed, uh, I had even more at one stage. Uh, I was running the head and neck pathology team as well. So um, they, they unfortunately lost their lead, retired a bit early, and they asked me to step in and look after that whole load of specialist BMSs who I'd never really met for a whole year. And they had UCAS inspections, uh, accreditation inspections, all kinds of things. And um, I had to get used to a whole set of specialist uh, pathologists that deal with head and neck tumours and a whole group of BMS staff who who basically needed my help, really, to be frank, um, a little bit scared about what was going on, a little bit worried, and uh, they were fantastic when I, when I went to see them, and uh, again, adopted the same attitude, just uh, talk through the problems, uh, listen, discuss, agree, and then move forward, and generally speaking, throughout my career, that's what I've done with most of the things that I've been given to do, so I think that's, that's the way to manage in my opinion, and be very open with your staff. Very interesting, very good. One other thing, if there's a social event, always put an effort in, that's the other thing, because they expect to see you socialise with them, that's very important as a manager, I think, that you are interactive with your staff, and that they, they see you as one of them, that you are not somebody to fear. Become approachable by adopting that attitude. And I guess the other aspect of things you also involve with on the four different editorial scientific journal boards. So. Well, with regard to that, that happened quite early in my career, I, and the first one, and then I got the academic bug, I guess, and, uh, you know, uh, 80 publications later, which is about where I am now, it just becomes a, a matter of habit. So I'm quite often writing papers on the train on the way home, or, you know, I'll get an idea and jot something down and it evolves into something else. I've done patents for devices I've made that, that have been sold actually I've made chemicals that are in the common domain and are used to help histological investigations and I'm currently working on a brand new hematoxylid idea which is now on the verge of a patent so those are my hobbies if you like my work related mm -hmm. hobbies and I was very fortunate enough to write a couple of books as well on following my PhD so two books out there which if you've got trouble sleeping you could read <laughs> oh that's only joking <laughs> so yeah they're, they're for students sitting these exams so I, I, I did write a couple of those they're in the uh, fundamentals of uh, biomedical science series and they're published by Oxford University Press and I did one on histopathology uh, I edited the book and, and wrote about seven of the chapters. And then there's another book called Cell Structure and Function, because I remember being trained, you had to understand what normal looked like before you could deal with what abnormal was all about. And it seemed to me, with all the teaching I was doing these days, that not all students fully appreciate what normal looks like before they start tackling what abnormal is. And one of the first things I do whenever I've got students and ask them, right, here's a tonsil, tell me what the parts of the tonsil are. And then you find out that they don't fully understand it all. Uh, mm. And they may think they do, but they don't. And then you have to go through that, that process of explaining, you need to know what this looks like. 
before you start dealing with what abnormal looks like. So that book is really the cell structure and function. It's about explaining what normal is. And then the histopathology one is all about the techniques we use to investigate disease. So that's really about all the things I've been up to over the years. I like a challenge. I like something to make me think, especially if it comes up with an idea that I think is new. Uh, I'm very keen on those things. I guess my team and the way I teach them here, I teach them to be innovative. That's what I want them to do. So I want them to make a difference. So I want them to embrace being innovative. And so whenever I get an opportunity to encourage them to do things like that and develop techniques and work on ideas, I often see the best in them. So it's it's a good way of selecting future candidates who probably possibly will be replacing me one day. So that's the way I look upon it. Awesome. Awesome. With your number of publications, uh, more than 80, and they're really broad scope. Yes, they are. Everything, yeah. <laughs> the hematoxylin you've talked about, um, Mohs, leadership, your all sorts of, of things. And how did you get involved in such a broad scope? And, and I don't know which ones might be your favorite. Good question. So I think it's a, it's a process of evolution. I, I was very fortunate to have a very good professor when I started. I guess he saw something in me. I don't know quite what. But he gave me quite a lot of encouragement and he taught me pathology. I was a sponge for it. So if, he, if I was with him and he was in the microscope, he, he would show me things as he was doing his reports and he'd let me listen in. And I quickly became quite academically triggered, I guess. So one publication encouraged me that I could do it. I got co-authored on one, then I decided I could write my own. And I started writing my own and then confidence grew from that. I got a bit of a buzz out of it. You know, you've got to get a buzz out of these things. I was also pointed doing it. I enjoyed it, then got asked to lecture. I enjoyed that. So it naturally fed on. And as my career evolved, my responsibilities were changing, but my diversity of academic interest was also expanding. And so I got involved in lots of different projects. And the most exciting area that I find at the moment is actually trying to do something new. So I did a lot of publications on immuno and, and developed uh, various techniques. And more recently, we got involved with the, uh, the BRAF labeling for melanoma and developing the immunocytochemistry rapid testing for that. Uh, that was quite enjoyable. So that was an area that I've always been interested in. But the hematoxylin things was something I was asked to lecture about. And then I started reading around it and then had lots of questions myself. and. A bit like a dog with a bone when I get going, I'm afraid. So when I start thinking about things, I start thinking about why wasn't that done? Who didn't do this? Why wasn't this done? Where's the evidence that that was done? And then ideas then come from that, and, and I started pursuing them. And a lot of the publications more recently have come from things like that, where I've just thought laterally about a problem and, and tried to come up with a strategy to, to investigate it. And invariably, that produces publications which my staff have all enjoyed engaging with me. So I think they entertain me a lot, my staff. <laughs> so um, they get something out of it, I get something out of it, and I'm driven to finish something that I've started. So, and the latest idea is this development of a brand new hematoxin. So I, I'm very close with that at the moment, and um, that's going to be something for next year, I suspect. Yeah, that's pretty amazing, actually, starting at lectures and and ending up at a new type of hematoxylin? Well, I've been asked to talk on, on all these subjects over time course. Yeah. And, uh, uh -huh. uh, I, you know, if I come across something or somebody says something, or I don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll write something down that sparks something in, in my mm -hmm. psyche that says, hang on a minute, that's quite interesting. I'll, I'll have another mm -hmm. look at that. And, um, and that's really often the best way to be, I think. I, know, I guess the only other question I didn't get to is, um, what achievements are you most proud of? throughout your career? Well, this is always a, an awkward question because I'm quite proud of a lot of achievements over the years. Most most recently, of course, winning this award. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll just do a very quick potted history because I started off at 19, a not very confident, not very assured young man who thought he was quite good at science but didn't really fully appreciate it, but just lacked a lot of confidence. And then fortuitously, and I guess it's through sheer hard work, not through any natural ability at the time, but hard work, 
I managed to do very well in the exams at college that I was sitting to gain my qualifications. And in, in those days, you were given day release to go to college. And so I had to go to college for two years to start off to do all this preliminary studying, which is all biomedical science. And I did very well. I got the, I got the highest pass in the year. And so I won an award for the first time in my life. I, I, I was given a book prize and I thought, wow. Uh, I, I can do this. You know, it was all about confidence, you see, and I suddenly realized that it was about confidence and I didn't have a lot of it. And then from that, I then went on to the next exam, set of exams, and it got slightly better because um, that was the fellowship exams. And I, I won another award, uh, this time for getting the highest pass in the United Kingdom for that cohort in that year across all disciplines. And that was called the RJ Lavington Award. And I, I won that. Yeah. And suddenly, Confidence was growing from that, that success. And then I went on to do my master's and that, that was immunology. And so I was going to do immunology and uh, I was working in the histopath lab, but I was studying immunology and I had no idea what an ELISA was. <laughs> um, whereas all the ones in my class who were working in immunology at labs knew exactly what they were doing. So I thought, oh dear, I made a bad mistake here. This is going to be terribly difficult. Uh, but I persevered and again at the end of the three-year course I got a distinction even though I wasn't even working in that discipline so that was something I was very proud of and then I realized again it was all about confidence and, and just working very hard at everything and uh, I, I was a bit like that that was the MSc then I was asked to lecture here there and everywhere and I started doing that and that included international lectures and by the way uh, I'm looking forward to coming back over to the NSH sometime soon I haven't been over for a couple of years and I'd very much like to come back not only with your, your NSH conference, but I also lectured on the American Society of Mohs Histotechnologists conference that you hold annually over there. That I'm pretty much a regular for them over there. And I've been to Australia a few times lecturing for them, as well as all the several universities up and down the land in, 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 in the UK and Scotland. So that, that carried on. That went on for about 10 years. And I was all this time writing papers all the way through that period carried on writing papers, usually about three or four a year. And then I got asked, why haven't you done a PhD? Uh, this was about 2010. And I said, well, I'm not in a research environment, really. I'm in a diagnostic environment. And they said, but you've written a lot of papers. And I said, yes, that's true. And uh, they reviewed them and they said, I should have done the PhD years ago. And uh, I did a PhD by publication. So it's, it's, if, you, if you like, it's uh, doing a PhD in reverse. So all the publications that I'd done, they selected 10. They all had to be done within the last five years. And I had to write the thesis up based on those 10 publications, hmm. which is what I did. I then had a three hour viva and I passed that well. Uh, and I was awarded a PhD in 2010. I had one year to, to write my thesis and prepare for the viva. It was all very, very tight timeline. And I got my PhD and then what happened then? I got asked to write the books. Uh, so that was the add-ons, and then I started thinking laterally, and wanted to do to to develop things and and patent products and try and make a difference there because I hadn't done a lot of that. But it's a natural progression if you think about it. After studying all those years, you start to think laterally. That's just human nature. You understand all the concepts. You're now thinking of how you can improve the concepts. Mm. So that's the lateral thinking, and that happens when the confidence is high. And the training has been good and you have comprehensive understanding. So you think laterally and you start to try and do things that make a difference. The journals, editorial ships and things like that have come, come along all the way through that time course. And, and they're still coming along now. Uh, I now have to be a bit more selective about what I say yes to, only because I don't want to overcommit. And I know I still have a significant role to play in our examination pathways in the United Kingdom as we develop these new exams. So uh, I still got a number of years left and I fully intend to carry on doing what I'm doing. And I guess from a starting as a very timid 19 year old boy who had very little confidence, I, I don't think people will recognize that in me now. Yeah. So I think that's about the potted history of what I've been doing. <laughs> yeah, very awesome. Thank you for, for your time and thank you for all the things that you've shared. I think I've learned a lot and I hope our the listeners have, have learned a lot as well. Well, I hope I didn't bore you. <laughs>